Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll uh, go ahead and get started. My name is Arun Sharma. I'm a head neck surgeon at Southern Illinois University. I'll be talking this morning about management of occult and uh, of unknown and occult primary squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Um, if anyone has questions or wants clarification, feel free to, to speak up uh, at any time, whether it's in the middle or towards the end. I want this to be as, as helpful as, as possible uh, for everybody. So unknown primary squamous cell carcinoma, which I'll abbreviate as such, um, is defined as a metastatic cervical lymph node squamous cell carcinoma without evidence of primary tumor after appropriate investigation. And we'll discuss a little bit more about what such appropriate investigation involves. Uh, this entity uh, represents up to 5% of all squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck, and actually that, that percentage might even be going up. Uh, the usual presentation is a painless neck mass, uh, which um, as most of you know, uh, painless neck mass for more than two weeks in an adult is malignancy until proven otherwise. Uh, oftentimes the uh, primary site is, is fairly obvious when the patient presents, but in some cases it's not obvious. Uh, the neck level of involvement can often help suggest the primary site and help direct um, appropriate workup. So in patients who have a level two neck mass, which is in the upper jugular chain, that's often an oral pharyngeal primary, uh, but not always. Uh, if it's in level five, that could be um, a cutaneous primary or nasopharynx, but also could be other entities such as thyroid, which is usually not squamous cell carcinoma, but that could be um, the source of the uh, neoplastic uh, lymph node. The patients who present with cystic uh, lymph nodes, that's usually, uh, that, or that often is a P16 positive or a pharyngeal primary or a cutaneous primary, but again, thyroid is also in the differential, but again, that's usually not squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, there is an increasing proportion of unknown primary uh, squamous cell carcinomas uh, that are HPV positive um, or pharyngeal cancers. And the classic presentation is a, a small primary site with a large neck node. And because the primaries are usually small, uh, you could see how, um, how the oftentimes these will present as, as unknown primaries. Uh, this is some data just to show um, uh, trends over time. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is that um, unknown primaries seem to be becoming more common. And uh, this uh, data is single institution data, which shows uh, uh, incidence in terms of number of cases per year uh, of unknown primary squamous cell carcinomas with data going uh, from 2005 until 2014. Uh, and over that uh, roughly 10 year period, uh, there's been a fairly steady increase in, um, in the incidence of unknown primary squamous cell carcinoma, which is seen, shown on the, the graph on the left. On the right, um, the authors um, assessed the rate of HPV positivity in those cases, and that seems to be fairly high uh, as you can imagine, early on in this cohort, uh, there were a number of patients whose HPV status was unknown because of the amount of testing that was done um, uh, in the early 2000s. But when testing became more common, uh, it became clear that uh, the majority of uh, unknown primary squamous cell carcinomas are, are truly HPV positive and likely represent an oral pharyngeal primary. In terms of management of unknown primary, there are, um, we have a couple goals. One is to identify the primary site. Uh, that's helpful because that can help guide uh, treatment and prognosis. And the next is to appropriately uh, treat them. So we'll discuss that uh, in the next couple slides. So in terms of identification of primary, uh, one of the, the critical um, things to know is the viral status of that cancer. And so that reflects two tests. One is um, HPV or human papilloma virus status. Um, we know that HPV positivity is fairly high in oral pharyngeal cancers. And uh, one of the tests for that is HPV in situ hybridization. But another test that's helpful is P16. Uh, P16 is a, is a biomarker uh, which serves as a surrogate for HPV status. It's also helpful because P16 is, to be, is known to be a, a prognostic factor uh, with uh, improved prognosis, especially for oral pharyngeal and unknown primary cancers. P16 status is recommended to be used by 
guidelines from the NCCCN and um, AJCC. It's also uh, recommended by the American College of Pathologists in their uh, guidelines for oral pharyngeal cancer. Uh, so when a patient presents um, with an unknown primary, a P16 status um, is helpful. Uh, in some cases, getting HPV uh, in situ hybridization may be needed as well, but definitely starting with P16 is appropriate. The next uh, viral marker is uh, that for Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, and the commonly done test is EBER testing, which is the EBV uh, encoded RNA in situ hybridization. Getting these two tests, uh, P16 and EBER, will help guide your workup and can help um, uh, help direct your physical examination and workup. It can also help with um, counseling patients in terms of prognosis, especially if the patient is P6, if the patient's cancer is P16 positive. There are additional tools that we have for identification of the primary site. This includes a standard physical examination and, and a flexible laryngoscopy. Uh, Cross-sectional imaging is helpful, including uh, either CT and or MRI. Some of this is uh, surgeon or institution dependent. Uh, PET-CT has an important role, and we'll talk about some of the data behind PET-CT in, in unknown primary squamous cell carcinoma. And there are procedures ranging, ranging from uh, panendoscopy to uh, palatine and lingual tonsillectomy. So uh, PET-CT, as I mentioned earlier, can be um, uh, advantageous to identify the primary. A number of studies have assessed uh, identification rates um, of the primary with PET-CT. They do vary. Uh, by study, uh, but two of the largest studies, which included um, almost 200 patients each, demonstrated that there was approximately 45% uh, primary identification rate uh, with PET-CT. It's important that um, uh, PET-CT imaging um, uh, is performed uh, prior to any biopsies, and there's a few reasons for this. Uh, one reason is to avoid false positives. Uh, many of these cancers are going to be in the pharynx, so to do a biopsy requires a trip to the operating room um, and, uh, and might require placement of a mouth gag or a laryngoscope, and that uh, could result in false positives if the PET-CT is done afterwards. Also, if the PET-CT is done before the biopsies, uh, that might help save um, uh, a trip to the operating room or prevent multiple trips to the operating room. So, so usually a PET-CT is um, helpful before performing pharyngeal biopsies. Uh, in the OR. Uh, one important thing to note is that uh, um, the PET-CT does have some issues with specificity, so there can be false positives or diffuse activity in the oropharynx, and uh, one uh, study showed that the oropharyngeal false positive rate is around 15%, so about 15% of patients may have uh, focal activity in the oropharynx or just diffuse activity throughout the lymphoid tissue, and, and that makes PET-CT harder to interpret in some cases. Uh, for that reason, um, even though PET-CT is helpful, um, it's important to confirm the primary site uh, with pathologic um, um, uh, uh, confirmation with biopsy, uh, even if it is very suggestive. In addition to PET-CT, another um, uh, tool is, uh, is, um, uh, is surgical uh, lingual tonsillectomy to identify the primary site. Uh, this can be helpful in patients whose uh, PET-CT is, is not, help, is not uh, diagnostic, um, or if it does suggest that there's a, a primary in the base of tongue. The lingual tonsil tissue, as you know, is, is the lymphoid tissue that is in the base of tongue. And uh, lingual tonsillectomy can be performed in a number of ways. Um, two common uh, techniques are with transoral robotic surgery or TORS, or with transoral laser microsurgery or TLM. Uh, whether you use TORS or TLM is as a matter of surgeon preference and, and a number of factors. And I certainly don't want to um, favor one or the other, but as you can probably notice from the instrumentation that I have in my picture, I'm, I'm, I use uh, the robot for this, but uh, TLM is also uh, reasonable. So lingual tonsillectomy, um, when performing this, it's critical to essentially remove all of the mucosa um, in the area of interest. So it should really be a thorough mucosectomy of the base of tongue. The boundaries of the lingual tonsils uh, include um, the anterior border, which is the circumvillar papillae between the base of tongue and, and oral mucosa. So in the picture here on the right, um, anterior is, is the top of the screen, and so the uh, circumvillar papilla would be just next to the retractor that's there. The medial border is the midline, the posterior border is the follicular, and lateral border is the pharyngeal wall. So uh, 
lingual tonsillectomy would look something like this. Uh, in the um, in the shaded out part, I, I went a little bit past the midline, but but a, a thorough lingual tonsillectomy would remove all of that um, mucosal and lymphoid tissue, uh, so that it could be assessed pathologically for the um, for the presence of a primary site. Uh, here's a um, pathologic image of the tissue of the base of tongue. Uh, as you can see, the lingual tonsil tissue is right at the right at the surface and superficial. Uh, deeper is, are the minor salivary gland tissue, which is shown as MS, as well as muscle, um, which has which is uh, deeper as well. So um, you can see the blue lines on on those diagrams, and that's uh, the avascular plane uh, for lingual tonsillectomy that you want to be in while when performing this procedure. So when we go back to this patient who had an unknown primary, um, when I had, had initially done the um, pan endoscopy to assess this area, there were a couple areas that I thought were sort of suspicious for the primary because there was some irregularity in cryptic tissue. Uh, that can be helpful, but um, uh, remember that lymphoid tissue or tonsillar tissue often has that cryptic tissue. And so those areas with circles were the areas that I felt were the likely sites of the primary site. Uh, of this cancer, but it turned out that it was actually the uh, area with the double circled lines, which was not really an area that I had initially suspected. And that really demonstrates the benefit of doing a thorough lingual tonsillectomy because sometimes these cancers are fairly hard to see. And um, really, if you, the best uh, way to sometimes assess them is by a removal of um, that lingual tonsil tissue and, and pathologic assessment. There have been a number of studies that have um, um, assess the role of lingual tonsillectomy, uh, especially with TORS for identification of the primary. And the identification rate is, is roughly around 80%. It ranges from 72 to 94%, depending on the study. Uh, the primary sites uh, that can be identified are uh, basal tongue tissue, which is a tumor in the lingual tonsils, or um, palatine tonsil. Uh, that's about 50-50, uh, but there is a, a broad range depending on the study. Obviously, um, uh, TORS or TLM is not needed to do a palatine tonsillectomy, but, they, but those are helpful uh, tools for uh, lingual tonsillectomy. Another important thing to remember is that the contralateral palatine tonsil um, has been reported to be the primary in unknown primary cancers in up to 10% of cases. And so in some uh, patients, uh, it might be helpful to do uh, or to assess the palatine tonsil. However, I would caution you that um, that it can be potentially very dangerous to perform simultaneous bilateral palatine and lingual tonsillectomy. Um, oropharyngeal stenosis has been reported when patients uh, undergo that, the simultaneous bilateral palatine and lingual tonsillectomy. So if there is concern about the, pal the contralateral palatine tonsil, um, either that could be biopsied or removed by itself, or the procedure could be staged in such a way. Uh, one helpful way to think about this is that um, when it comes to unknown primaries, there's sort of four tonsils. There's um, the right and left palatine tonsil and the right and left lingual tonsil. You can safely remove um, three of those at the same time, but if you remove all four, then, uh, then there's that concern about oropharyngeal stenosis. So one common practice is to do an ipsilateral palatine tonsillectomy and then bilateral lingual tonsillectomy, um, and that uh, does have a fairly high uh, success rate. Uh, if you're concerned about that contralateral tonsil, you could always uh, come back to the OR uh, a few weeks later to remove the contralateral tonsil and, and um, to get that pathologic information without uh, risking uh, stenosis. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a systematic review from a few years ago that summarized uh, the use of TORS and TLM to identify the primary site. Uh, this included a total of 139 patients in this, the mean uh, diameter of the primary site was just over one centimeter. Uh, there was fairly, fairly variable workup amongst uh, the various institutions and, and surgeons that were involved. The rate of suspicious findings was about 18% on physical exam. It was fairly low on cross-sectional imaging, it was around 10%, and that's why these were classified as unknown primaries. And similar to prior studies, uh, PET-CT uh, did show suspicious findings about 44% of the time. And taken together, uh, physical exam, cross-sectional imaging, and PET-CT uh, found suspicious findings just over 50% of the time. However, that means that in about 45% of patients with unknown primaries, um, there's really not going to be uh, 
any suspicious findings on any of our um, uh, initial workup between uh, physical exam, imaging, and PET-CT. Uh, pan endoscopy with biopsies was able to um, identify the primary uh, about 23% of the time. Uh, but again, that left a uh, particular room for improvement. Uh, when TORS or TLM was incorporated into this, um, into this systematic review, there is an overall identification rate of 80%. So that's much higher than any of the other prior numbers. That's why I wanted to highlight this, um, this systematic review. Uh, the identification rate was higher in patients with suspicious findings on any of the prior studies compared to those without, for, and that seems fairly obvious. So there are um, some important considerations when you think about the use of TORS in, in workup uh, of primary, of unknown primary uh, and to help identify the, um, the primary site. Uh, you know, availability is, is a key issue, um, both of surgical equipment and surgical, um, uh, and the surgeon. Uh, this is becoming less of an issue as there's increased training in uh, robotic surgery and increased uh, availability of, um, of robotic systems. You also want to think about the prevalence of HPV and HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer in your specific practice. Uh, in most practices in the United States, um, HPV is fairly prevalent, uh, but there is some um, uh, regional variation. However, in a patient who has an HPV negative unknown primary, um, it's likely that TORS or TLM are, are less helpful. Uh, there was a recent uh, study that showed that TORS only identify the primary 13% of the time in patients with HPV negative unknown primary squamous cell carcinoma. That's a fairly low identification rate. And so if someone has a P16 negative cancer, um, undergoing a mucosectomy of the base of the tongue is, likely, is unlikely to be helpful. Another issue is uh, cost, and there has been some work done by this, on this uh, using a third-party payer perspective. And they found that, um, that patients who underwent pan endoscopy followed by TORS uh, had a cost of about $8,600. However, the cost was significantly reduced if pan endoscopy and TORS were performed under the same uh, surgical session. So at our institution, our, our practice is um, to do the imaging workup that I talked about. If there's still an unknown primary, uh, then we plan to proceed to the operating room. We initially would perform a pan endoscopy, uh, which includes um, direct laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, esophagoscopy, as well as uh, nasal endoscopy. If that uh, identifies the primary, then we have an answer. If that doesn't, then we would proceed with TORS during the same surgical session. And, and the reason is to minimize trips to the operating room and, and to minimize cost. Um, but it's still important to remember that pan endoscopy still has a role. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, TORS and TLM, but this can still identify up to you know, a quarter, up to 31% of, of patients uh, with negative PET-CT. So we don't wanna just skip over pan endoscopy and, and go straight to TORS or TLM. Next, I'll shift gears a little bit and talk more about sort of staging and management of unknown primary uh, squamous cell carcinoma. If a patient un undergoes the, the workup that we talked about with physical exam, laryngoscopy, uh, panendoscopy, and other procedures, and the primary is found, then, then this cancer can be treated as appropriately indicated. So if it's a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal cancer, that can be treated um, as you would normally. However, um, a number of patients are going to remain as unknown primaries. And in those cases, it's helpful to use our viral markers that we talked about earlier. So if um, a patient is, patient's cancer is P16 positive, but EBER negative, that's likely going to be an oropharyngeal uh, primary that may have been cleared by immune surveillance. Um, and our treatment paradigm would, would mirror that for oropharyngeal primary cancer. It could also be a, a cutaneous or skin primary. Um, many skin cancers are P16 positive, even though, um, even though the etiology is independent of HPV involvement. And so it is important to consider that, especially if the patient has history of skin cancers, uh, sun exposure, or is um, slightly older. The other possibility is that it could be a, a P16 negative EBER positive cancer, which likely suggests a nasopharyngeal primary, and those would be uh, treated around, around the um, usual pathway for nasopharyngeal cancer. And finally, we'll, we'll have some unknown primaries that are P16 negative and EBER negative, 
And those are likely somewhere in the pharyngeal axis. It could be nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx, it also could be laryngeal. And so those, um, there's a fairly uh, large area of potential involvement in the, in the uh, double negative uh, unknown primary cancers. Uh, staging for the cancers that are either P16 or EVER positive is done with, as either oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal cancer, which is uh, new in the eighth edition of the AJCC. Um, it's a departure from what was done previously in the seventh edition. Uh, most of you are familiar with this, but I um, uh, displayed the images for uh, staging for uh, P16 positive cancers. Um, the clinical and pathologic staging is different uh, for Clinical staging uh, is based on size um, and whether or not the lymph nodes are contralateral or bilateral. Pathologic staging would be for patients who undergo a neck dissection. Um, patients would be N2 if they have more than four lymph nodes that are involved. Uh, based on that, that helps determine the overall, um, overall stage, uh, the overall clinical stage um, would, be, um, uh, would be dependent on uh, the extent of nodal involvement. Uh, the same is true for a pathologic stage. So in those P16 positive patients where it's, where it's uh, likely an oropharyngeal uh, primary, uh, if there is concern about whether it's oropharyngeal or cutaneous, uh, this is a situation where HPV and Cy2 hybridization uh, could be helpful to confirm that it truly is um, uh, likely an oropharyngeal primary because um, oropharyngeal cancers will be P16 positive and HPV um, uh, positive, whereas the cutaneous cancers could be P16 positive but HPV negative. Again, these often have level two involvement. Uh, for patients who have uh, N1 disease, um, options would be to consider either a neck dissection or upfront radiation. Uh, this, um, you know, this decision is, is best done after appropriate discussion with the patient as well as at a multidisciplinary tumor board setting. Um, if the patient does undergo a neck dissection, then adjuvant therapy would be based on pathologic staging and NCCN guidelines. Uh, there's increasing interest in whether neck dissection alone is, is appropriate in this situation. And in our practice, we will consider a neck dissection alone if the patient is young, reliable, if they're a non-smoker, meaning that they have low risk for recurrence. In cases where there's a single node less than three centimeters and absence of extranodal extension or any adverse features. Uh, but this is an area of, uh, of particular interest and there's not much data to guide that decision making. So it's again best done after appropriate counseling and, and multidisciplinary discussion. In patients who have bulkier nodal disease, uh, usually um, at our institutions those are usually treated with chemo radiation. However, an alternative option would be to consider um, neck dissection followed by adjuvant therapy. Uh, the other possibility for P16 positive cancers is that it could have been from a cutaneous primary. Uh, often those patients will have, some patients will have multiple skin cancers and that skin cancer may have been removed at an earlier uh, surgical session. Uh, again, this is where HPV in situ hybridization can be helpful. Uh, usually the uh, patient presentation is very different than someone with an oropharyngeal primary. Someone with a cutaneous primary usually has a history of significant sun exposure and prior skin cancers. They'll often present with uh, nodal disease in the parotid or level five. In these patients, usually neck dissection is, is felt to be appropriate. And again, uh, adjuvant therapy would be based on uh, final pathology and NCCN guidelines. You could consider a non-surgical option if patients are frail or have multiple comorbidities, um, as um, many cutaneous uh, cancers with nodal involvement will be fairly responsive to, uh, to radiation. Um, and potentially could benefit from targeted therapies like cetuximab. So next we'll go to the EBV positive uh, unknown primaries. These are staged similarly to nasopharyngeal cancers. Um, and depending on uh, the extent of nodal involvement, uh, these would be either uh, overall stage uh, two, three, or four. Um, one thing to remember is that the nodal staging for um, EBV positive and nasopharyngeal cancers is a little bit different than the rest of the head and neck. Uh, so um, N1 refers to unilateral nodal disease with all the lymph nodes under six centimeters. N2 is either um, 
bilateral or contralateral nodal metastasis. Um, and uh, N3 would be lymph nodes over six centimeters uh, or with extension inferior to the cricoid cartilage. In most patients who have EBER positive unknown primaries, usually the um, preferred modality ends up being chemo radiation. Uh, nasopharyngeal cancer is, is usually not primarily a surgical disease and um, the management of EBER positive unknown primaries uh, mirrors that. Since it's N positive, usually radiation alone is not considered. So it is usually chemo radiation, usually done in the concurrent setting. Uh, there's um, long time interest on whether there's a role for induction chemotherapy and or adjuvant chemotherapy after concurrent chemo radiation. And some of that remains unknown, um, uh, but certainly concurrent chemo radiation seems appropriate in these patients. And then finally, we have our P16 negative, EBV negative patients, and, and those would be uh, staged um, using the um, unknown primary uh, tumor staging of the um, eighth edition of the AJCC. I uh, copied that here. That's similar to uh, nodal staging for um, other head and neck cancers. And just to, to review that, N1 is single node that's three centimeters or smaller without extra nodal extension. Um, N2A is single node over three centimeters, but less than six. N2B is multiple ipsilateral nodes. N2C is either bilateral or contralateral nodes. And N3A is nodes over six centimeters. And then the final is any lymph node with clinically overt ENE, either on clinical exam or radiographic, um, or the radiographic findings would be an N3B. Uh, the pathologic uh, staging is a little bit different and, uh, than the clinical, but this incorporates E and E to a greater extent. Uh, and an easy way to remember this is that it's similar to the clinical staging, except if there is E and E um, from our neck dissection specimen, then it gets basically bumped up one level. So uh, a single node that's under three centimeters is normally N1, but if that same node has E and E, it gets bumped up to, a, um, uh, to an N2A. And, and um, the rest of the staging roughly parallels that. Uh, if there's anything that would have been an N2 before, gets bumped up to an N3B if there's E and E. And the overall staging for these um, um, P16 negative and EBER negative uh, unknown primaries is stage three to four, depending on um, uh, the bulk of the uh, nodal disease. In terms of management options for P16 negative and EBER negative patients, uh, here's um, a screenshot of the NCCN guidelines, which are fairly broad. You know, options range from neck dissection to radiation to uh, chemo radiation. Um, there, um, historically, a lot of these were treated with upfront neck dissection uh, with adjuvant therapy afterwards, and that seems to be occurring less in, in the literature, uh, but there is still likely a role for neck dissection in patients with um, uh, N1 disease, um, especially if, um, if it's uh, only a single node that's small. Um, the other options would be radiation for, uh, again, that same single small node, or chemo radiation for multiple or bulky nodes. Um, in our practice, we usually favor uh, radiation or chemo radiation, um, unless uh, certain situations. So if a patient has very bulky disease, uh, there, there often could be concerned that, uh, that the patient's uh, cancer won't respond to a non-surgical treatment. And so it might make sense to do an upfront neck dissection followed by um, uh, chemo radiation. Um, or the other end of the spectrum, which is very small disease um, in a single node, uh, which could be considered for a neck dissection. If, and again, if a cutaneous primary is suspected and uh, usually treatment involves surgical treatment with neck dissection, uh, possibly with parotidectomy and, and adjuvant therapy if needed. Uh, one of the um, areas of uh, particular interest is the extent of radiation fields. Um, in a patient who's being treated for an unknown primary cancer. Uh, the standard approach uh, was to uh, radiate the entire pharyngeal axis, which goes from the um, nasopharynx down to the larynx and uh, hypopharynx and includes both necks. Uh, this was um, uh, due to the fact that we didn't know where the primary site was um, and that uh, both necks were thought to be at risk. Uh, 
<clears throat> a number of studies have shown that this is um, effective. And one of the, the recent ones uh, looked at a series of patients uh, treated as, at a single institution between 1995 and 2012. They had 85 patients who were treated for unknown primary. Uh, in this uh, cohort of patients, almost 80% of them had unknown P16 status. And that reflects the time point because during much of this study, the um, P16 and HPV testing was not standard. And actually, we were just starting to understand the role of that um, uh, viral uh, factor. And in some ways, that's actually helpful in this study because uh, we didn't know about it, so it didn't influence the decision making. Uh, in this study, about 62% of the patients had upfront neck dissection. Uh, after that, they were then treated with um, either radiation or chemo radiation. Uh, roughly half of them got radiation, roughly the other half got chemo radiation. And that decision was based on the extent of disease, as well as that patient uh, ability to tolerate uh, treatment. And the majority of patients underwent treatment in the standard approach, which was treatment of the entire pharyngeal axis and uh, bilateral necks. We had some fairly robust uh, outcome data uh, from this study. Uh, the five-year local regional recurrence-free survival was 86%. There were no recurrences in the pharynx, so this seemed to suggest that treating that entire pharyngeal axis was, was effective. Uh, there were recurrences in the neck, more often in the ipsilateral neck, but sometimes in the contralateral neck. Uh, there were 13% of patients who developed distant metastatic disease, and the five-year overall survival was 75%. And that's shown on the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve on the right. Finally, there was a trend towards uh, significance for overall, overall survival uh, based on bulk of disease. Uh, so patients who had N1 or N2A disease, so a single lymph node, had almost 90% uh, overall survival compared to those with N2B or greater disease where it was uh, just less than 70%. And so this, uh, this study demonstrates that uh, you know, treatment along the entire pharyngeal axis and bilateral necks can be fairly effective in these patients. Uh, however, um, there are increasing uh, side effects with uh, 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 treatment of the entire uh, pharyngeal axis, especially relating to uh, dysphagia. And so there's, there's been increasing interest in narrowing some of the radiation fields. And there is some non-randomized data that suggests that narrower radiation fields are safe. I wanted to review some of that data. Uh, there was one study with 76 patients who underwent either unilateral or bilateral radiation. Uh, this study was relatively recent, but P16 status was not reported. And they found that there is no statistically significant difference between ipsilateral and bilateral radiation regarding uh, relating to overall survival, recurrence-free survival, um, primary tumor, or distant met uh, metastasis. Uh, another similar study uh, looked at unilateral radiation for P16 positive cancers specifically uh, and uh, compared uh, those in the unilateral radiation group to the bilateral radiation group and there were no failures in the primary site or the neck. The other um, area of interest is whether uh, the pharynx can be entirely omitted from the radiation fields and so there was a third study that I'm showing here that compared pharyngeal sparing radiation to uh, pharyngeal radiation after patients underwent a uh, thorough workup with transoral robotic surgery and were still classified as T0, meaning that no primary was, sound, was found in the lingual or palatine tonsils. Uh, this patient include, this uh, study included both P16 negative and P16 positive uh, patients. And uh, two-year overall survival was comparable between the pharyngeal sparing and the pharyngeal treatment uh, groups. However, in the pharyngeal sparing group, uh, there was significantly less uh, grade 2 mucositis. Uh, virtually all the patients who had pharyngeal radiation developed mucositis compared to only 20 percent uh, or less than 20 percent where uh, they had pharyngeal sparing treatment. There was markedly less opioid use, uh, less about a third as much weight loss, uh, decreased use of uh, uh, feeding tubes, and decreased uh, unplanned hospitalizations. So there definitely does seem to be a, a benefit from a um, side effect and quality of life standpoint. Um, however, we have to take some of these studies, um, uh, we have to look at some of these studies carefully because they're relatively small. They all include less than 100 patients total. They're not randomized. And uh, decisions about the extent of treatment were, were made by uh, 
uh, the radiation oncologist in terms of what was safest for the patients from an oncologic standpoint. Uh, based on some of this and other data, there are some consensus guidelines uh, from, the, from our radiation oncology colleagues, which have looked at uh, target volumes in definitive radiation. Uh, these guidelines look uh, more at the nodal target volumes as opposed to the mucosal ones. Um, and uh, the easy one is that they agree with using conformal techniques like IMRT for precise targeting and, and sparing of tissues that can be spared. Um, bilateral neck radiation is recommended for EVV positive unknown primaries. And that's because the nodal drainage of the nasopharynx is felt to be uh, bilateral. However, the issue of, of unilateral versus bilateral neck radiation remains controversial. And, and uh, for that reason, uh, no specific consensus guidelines could be developed. Um, you know, the, the data that I mentioned on prior slides as well as others is, is interesting and uh, suggests that there's probably a subset of patients who can undergo, uh, you know, unilateral neck radiation or pharyngeal sparing uh, radiation, but uh, we still have to really look at this carefully if we're going to be doing this outside of uh, any clinical trials. So this is an area where we'll probably have uh, increasing data over the coming years. So in, as I get close to wrapping up, I wanted to um, um, comment on um, how we manage these patients in the current uh, COVID-19 era. Obviously, um, we're here, here talking today because COVID-19 has markedly impacted how we take care of our patients. And so I do have some thoughts on that. Uh, there's some data, but it's, it's um, in its infancy. But we know that mucosal surgeries and mucosal procedures seem to be at high risk for COVID-19 transmission. That includes flexible laryngoscopy, uh, that includes panendoscopy, and it certainly includes uh, procedures like um, lingual tonsillectomy. Um, so uh, it's important to tailor treatment, um, including workup and management, uh, to specific patients and, 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 and include a multidisciplinary approach because these, these, uh, uh, these questions are hard even before the COVID-19 era, and now they're even harder. Uh, it could be that in some cases we could give greater considerations for non-surgical management to avoid some of the risks of surgery. But it is important to remember that uh, treatments such as radiation and chemoradiation um, has risks. It requires multiple visits to, um, to see healthcare providers, um, which, which um, does result in uh, expenditure in uh, PPE and other resources. Um, so it, it, it's something that has to be tailored to the patient and to your specific institution. So a couple of things to think about or factors to consider as we uh, think about how to um, best um, offer treatment to patients. We have to think about risk to patients, uh, such as their specific risk of uh, acquiring uh, COVID-19, but also risk to other patients that they might be in proximity to. We have to think about risk to healthcare workers, uh, use of critical resources such as PPE, and overall outcome. Now, we certainly don't want to be offering uh, treatments or paradigms to patients where the overall outcome is worse, but in cases where it might be comparable between two options, uh, that's where we could try to incorporate some other factors, such as those that I mentioned and discussed. Uh, certainly, we'll be uh, learning more about this in, in the future, and so uh, this was uh, definitely an evolving uh, uh, area. So in finishing up, there are some areas of controversy. One is, you know, optimal workup. We, I talked about uh, the things that have been shown to be beneficial, such as physical exam, laryngoscopy, panendoscopy, and lingual tonsillectomy, but the exact optimal workup um, uh, is still uh, being uh, investigated. Uh, we're still looking into how P16 status affects decision making here and whether we can de-escalate uh, some of the treatment. Uh, specifically, uh, we want to know when neck dissection alone is adequate um, as appropriate de-escalation and when can radiation fields be safely narrowed. So hopefully we'll have more on this in the coming years. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Seeing or hearing none so far, I'll um, uh, go ahead and finish up then. But um, my email address is there, so if anyone has any questions that come up, I'm always happy to to discuss them. And um, uh, thanks everyone for your time and attention. Hopefully this was helpful, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, the rest of this lecture series is beneficial. I want to thank um, uh, the the folks uh, who helped uh, put this together. I think it's uh, 
think it's a, a good use of the um, the time that we have currently. So thanks everybody.